Hello, 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 I'm Nogi, and in this video you're gonna learn how I created my character Daisy and put her in an, into an environment to create the final piece called Rendezvous. Starting with sculpting. Just like in real life, we can model or sculpt in Blender as well using digital clay, basically. And at first, I'm just trying to create the general shape of the character, starting with the head. The head and especially the face has the most features to make the character unique, so that's what I'm always focusing on first. For this project, I had a main reference image that I've tried to recreate in 3D in my own style. So I already had the look that I was going for, now it's just a matter of how well I can translate the drawn features and proportions into three-dimensional shapes. If the head doesn't look right even in the beginning stages, I don't even start creating the body. I'm blocking out the main parts of the face, like the eyes, nose and lips, and when all of that looks right, I'm going over to the body. The head is also a great way to measure the proportions of the character. A guideline that I always follow is 7.5 heads equal the height of the whole character, including the head. Half of that would be the legs, and half of that would be the upper body. Also, three heads next to each other equal the shoulder width. Of course, it can always vary a little bit. So I'm basically slowly working myself down all the way to the feet. For all of my characters, especially for the body, I focus on two layers individually. First I create the musculature layer, basically trying to focus on the volume and shape of the muscles without any fat on top of them. And afterwards, if the muscles look right, I add the fat on top of it. This way I can make sure that both layers look realistic and natural, and I don't have to guess how both layers would interact with each other. Usually my characters are quite skinny and quite fit, so for her I wanted to challenge myself a little bit and maybe add a little bit more fat to her body, similar to like a plus size models for example. I also added this extra layer of musculature to her body underneath the fat basically to make her appear a little bit more confident and dominant overall. Once I'm happy with the block out, I separated the head from the body so I can give the head more geometry through remeshing, which lets me add more detail to the face and give Daisy a distinct look. After I finished the human form, I added the animal traits, like the ears, changed the nose, added the horns, and also blocked out the hair so I can already see what the overall aesthetic, at least for the head, would look like. I also didn't sculpt the hands or feet, just because I didn't want to spend too much time on the sculpt itself, so I decided to add them later. Which we're gonna get to now, the cleanup. Basically like creating the line art after you've created your sketch drawing. What that means in 3D is cleaning up the geometry of your model, so that you and your PC can work more efficiently. I used an add-on called SoftWrap to reuse topology of two of my base meshes, and I stitched them together to create the final model. First I remove all the parts that aren't included in the sculpt, like the feet and the hands, as well as the inside of the mouth. And then SoftWrap lets me basically wrap the base mesh around the sculpt that I've created to capture the shape with this new model that has cleaner geometry. I can kind of push and pull the geometry like it's floating in midair and use pins to kind of keep them in place. Afterwards I reconnect all the pieces that I cut off before and I have the same model but with cleaner geometry. Now that the shape is done, it is time to give the model some color. The way you traditionally apply color to a 3D model is with 2D textures. For the packaging of a product, for example, you start with a two-dimensional piece of cardboard, you add color to it, and then you fold it into a three-dimensional box. We already have the three-dimensional object, so now we need to turn it back into a two-dimensional piece of cardboard, basically. So what we need to do is we need to basically turn the 3D model two-dimensional, so that each part of the geometry can fit onto the texture and each part of the geometry knows exactly what color it's supposed to be. We basically cut open the model so that we can lay it out in 2D space. I usually use two textures, two UDIM textures, so that I have more space for the whole body. The reason I use a different base mesh for the head model than what was already on the body base mesh is because the head model basically is already optimized for the head texture that I want to apply to it anyway. So I just had to stitch the head and body geometry together and the head is already perfectly textured. To color the body, I basically just copy and paste the texture of the head and neck to the rest of the body. Next, I refine and add more detail to areas of the model that I think are important, like the horns, eyes, nose and lips, where the detail might have been lost in the cleanup or I just haven't added any detail yet. To do that, I use the multi-rest modifier, which basically lets me divide the current geometry by four, so I have more geometry to add more fine details. Next up, it's time to create the shader for the model. Basically defining for the rendering engine that I'm using how the model interacts with the light in the scene. 
I'm using cycles for this project and basically all my projects. And to be a little bit more precise, I create a texture for the subsurface scattering and roughness values. They're basically just black and white values where black means zero and white means a one. So for the roughness map, for example, the blacker the texture is, the glossier the surface will be. Which might sound weird because the lips, for example, are wider than the rest of the body. And that is just because I invert the texture afterwards. It's just easier for me to paint with white rather than black. The subsurface scattering and roughness are set, but there's something big missing to make this look even more realistic, which is a bump texture. A bump texture enables you to create very, very fine details like the skin pores on your face, for example, without having to use geometry, but rather just using a texture. So it looks like the surface is actually deforming, but it's actually just smooth and it kind of fakes it. But the character still looks kind of creepy, and that is because she doesn't have any eyebrows or eyelashes yet. So I grabbed particle hair, eyebrows and eyelashes from another character and fit it onto her. Daisy's face and body is coming together quite well, so let's now give her some clothing. I'm becoming the personal tailor for Daisy to create her outfit. And the way I do it is basically by cutting out shapes of fabric or basically modeling them and then sewing them together to create the piece of clothing. I wanted to go with this sort of Greek mythology white robe and to make the folds and how the clothing drapes around the body more realistic, I use simulations. So I basically simulated how the clothing would sit on her body. For simulations, you need a cloth object, which is basically the outfit, and also a collision object, which is of course Daisy's body. I duplicated her body, removed her head and arms so that those wouldn't interfere during the animation. And then I did a lot of tweaking to the shape of the pieces of fabric so that the folds and the draping around the body looks just how I wanted it to look. I also gave her underwear, but that didn't need any simulation. So I just added it with surface snapping and the shrink wrap modifier so that the geometry basically sticks to her body rather than going through it or kind of floating above it. Daisy's body and outfit is looking good. So now it is time to prepare for the final photo shoot. The first thing I did is give her a pose. To move her though, she first needs to have a skeleton so that we can move her arms and legs more easily. Just like real life, if you didn't have any bones and muscles, I don't think you could move that well. Here in Blender, you don't need muscles, all you need is a skeleton. So I grabbed the human skeleton, aka rig, from the Rigify add-on in Blender and placed the bones where they would basically be in real life as well. To make the posing a little bit easier, I also make sure that the rotation of the bones is correct. Now that the skeleton is in place, we basically have to bind the geometry to the individual bones so that the finger of the model isn't being moved by the leg bone. I parent the geometry to the skeleton with automatic weights, and if I need to adjust something manually, I do it afterwards in weight painting. Now finally, Daisy is able to stretch out her arms, and I can pose her for the final image. The poses were heavily inspired by Sukimi chan's art. I went through quite a few and found three that I think would work quite well. I also placed the camera to see what the pose would look like in the end. And after I finished all three, I continued with the one that I liked the most. The problem with such a simple rig is that the deformations for the model are not going to be perfect. So after the pose is set, I go back into scope mode and try to fix all the deformation errors of the rig to make it look more natural. I add more volume where there should be more volume. And I also add squishing between two bodies parts that are being pushed together. Daisy's body is starting to look real nice after the fixes, so now it's time to build the environment around her. I didn't want to model all the props myself as well, so I went to Polyhaven and grabbed quite a few models off of there. The models don't have to be perfect as long as they work in the final shot. I cut the models into pieces so I could use the parts that I think would work quite well in the scene and put everything together to create the sofa with these pillows and this blanket around her. While already having the next step in mind, which is the object interactions. To make Daisy look like she's actually in the environment, we need to make her interact with the environment. That means if she's sitting on these pillows, the pillows are going to be squished together. If she's putting her hand on this sofa, she's going to create a sort of print, hand print on that sofa, pushing down on it, squishing it together so that nothing is clipping together. Because if you touch something, it doesn't phase through your hand. It actually is being pushed away by your hand. Some of these models didn't have that much geometry. So to make sure that I can actually create detailed enough deformations, I use the Multiress modifier again. And after making Daisy interact with the environment, it looks way, way more realistic. Daisy sitting comfortably in her pillow fortress, ready for the final shot. But the render view is still looking kind of muddy and not really appealing. So I'm going to focus on the lighting next. HDRIs are my first go-to to create a general mood for the scene. They're basically 360 degree images that capture the lighting conditions of the place they've been shot at. 
I love to use HDRIs for general surrounding lighting just because it gives you a very, very natural color to the shadows, for example, and also the highlights. But for this one, I wanted to also use a sunlight just so I can draw the attention specifically to certain areas. The lights are there, but I still wanted to customize the props a little bit more to match the character and feeling of Daisy. I changed the color and shading of the individual models and also added textures to make them fit the scene a little bit better. I went with this pink blue color scheme to add more saturated colors into the scene and sell the royal or majestic feeling that I was going for. And now on to the reason why I actually started this project. The new hair system in Blender 3.3. I created a children hair and note setup for this new system and I wanted to test it out on Daisy. If you're interested and you want to know more about it, make sure to check out the video that I posted before this one. I'm also going to link that one at the end of this video. So like a barber, I'm basically combing and cutting Daisy's hair into shape after I've actually added it to her head. The way I like to do it is in layers. The first layer is the fill layer to create the volume of the hair and also create the general shape. The second layer is basically for the surface of the hair. It is made out of individual hair strands, which give the surface of the hair more structure and also make it look more realistic. And then on top of that, I sometimes also add a detail layer, which creates these stray hairs, which sort of fly around the main body of the hair, or just kind of individual hair strands that can add a little bit more character to the hairstyle. I also separate different parts of the hairstyle so I can fully focus on one specific part and not affect all hair strands all the time. That can especially be a problem when I'm trying to add more hair to an area that I've already styled. For Daisy, I also add hair to the shoulders and the body overall because I wanted to see how well you could create fur with this new system as well. I think especially for fur, it'll be helpful to come up with a geometry node setup that generates interpolated children. That'll make it way easier to create evenly distributed hair over big surfaces. And that basically completes Daisy's look. Now I'm adding a few more details to the environment to fill up the scene and make it look a little bit more alive, like she's actually living there. Once again, everything in the foreground is from Poly Haven, except for the blanket. I also found a cool background image on Pinterest, which I've used in addition to a few custom models that I've created for pillars and walls and a balcony to create a background for the scene. The background brings more depth into the shot, which makes it feel more open, light and relaxing, which is exactly what I was going for. If you use an image for your background, you always have to make sure that the source of light, in this case the sun, is coming from the same direction as the rest of the shot. Otherwise, the shadows in the foreground and background are pointing in different directions, which of course isn't possible if it's a daylight scene like mine. And that basically finalizes the scene. Now I just need to export aka render the image, which took roughly 30 to 40 minutes. And then I used the Blender Compositor and I went to Photoshop to do a few color touch-ups and spice up the image just a little bit more. Which brings us to the final image. I'm curious, what is one thing you've learned from this video that you didn't know before? Feel free to put it in the comments. Maybe that'll be the topic for a future video. Thank you for watching. Make sure to check out one of these two videos. Hope you have a great day. Maybe I'll see you next time. See ya.